Okay, today we're happy to have Nick Rod from, are you at Berkeley or the lab? Officially Berkeley, but uh, affiliate at the lab. Okay, from UC Berkeley, who's gonna tell us about the consistent standard model effective field theory. Excellent, okay. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to present today. Obviously, I'm a bit disappointed I can't uh, visit in person, but I think I was actually at Davis a year ago, so in April of 2019. So back um, one year ago from this month, I was telling you about why I think that the three and a half KV line uh, is not coming from dark matter decay. And so actually there's been some developments on that front recently. You might've seen there's been some comment papers written about our work. Uh, so maybe I could say some words about those in the informal uh, discussion afterwards. But today I wanna talk about something totally different from what I normally think about. And this is this question of, if we take these ideas of IR consistency constraints on effective field theories that have found a lot of mileage in formal context, can we actually apply them to an effective field theory that we know has direct phenomenological relevance? And that's the standard model effective field theory. People have thought about this in a piecemeal sense in the, the literature before us, but what I've been doing more recently with Grant Remen is thinking, can we apply this systematically to the, the standard model effective field theory as a whole? And so what I want to tell you about today is some partial results we have in this direction. I think we already have some very exciting results, but also I want to leave you with the, the sense that there's, some very, um, uh, there's very much work left to be done. And so particularly what I'll be describing to you today is work that came out in two papers that I, I referenced at the bottom of the slides here. Uh, the first of these, we focused our attention to the bosonic smith, and then a paper that came out earlier this month, we focused our attention on the fermionic smith. So I'll give you some flavor of the results that came out of each of those. But sort of the, the big picture that I want you to just to start with when we're thinking about this work is as is depicted in the center of this slide here in this image. The idea is that we are currently um, having not seen any clear on-shell states show up at, a, at colliders like the LHC. One of the ways that we're instead looking for a breakdown of the standard model is in precision measurements that would be first show up through um, our co non-zero coefficients in the standard model when viewed as an effective field theory in the form of the um, irrelevant operators becoming um, giving an experimental signature. And so you can see in the center of this plot here, the experimentalists are currently searching for the, exactly these effects. Uh, and so far they haven't seen anything definitive, but the hope is that maybe in the coming years a, a non-zero value will begin to be preferred. If that's the case, one thing that we can already say before we do this search is that there are constraints just on this um, uh, space beyond what you might think about if you're just a purely Wilsonian effective field theorist. Um, as I'll review for you today, just the basic bedrock principles of field theory, such as unitarity, analyticity, and causality, tell us that not this entire space gives rise to a consistent theory, or at least consistent with those principles. And so this raises you know, various possibilities. Sort of the, the two ways of looking at this is one, you can think about this as placing a prior on the, um, the parameter space of the SMEF. Or secondly, if we actually do make a discovery and we're able to, for example, by an interference measurement, center the preferred value in this IR inconsistent regime, this would tell us that the new physics that's emerging is somehow violating one of our fundamental principles of, of field theory, which in itself, of course, new physics would be exciting full stop, but maybe this would be doubly exciting. So I think this is another way that you could hope to use our results. So with that big picture in mind, let me tell you how I want to organize the discussion today. The first thing I want to do is bring everybody up to speed and just remind you where these IR consistency arguments are. I appreciate that there's probably several members of the audience who are very familiar with these arguments, but if you're like I was about two years ago and had never really heard of these before, I wanna just make sure that everyone understands uh, sort of the, the core ideas of, of how we go from unitarity, analyticity and causality to actually set a constraint on the, um, the space of um, relevant operators. Then I'll tell you about the bounds that using these arguments we're able to place on both the bosonic SMIF and then the fermionic SMIF in this more recent work. I'll go on to talk about um, what our bounds look like in the context of various UV completions. Now, the way to think about what I'm gonna talk about in section four is that for any reasonable type of um, UV physics, reasonable in the sense of what people normally talk about, for example, supersymmetry, if I integrate out any of those states, well, then I better get a set of effective field theory coefficients consistent with our bounds. Because we know theories like supersymmetry don't violate our basic principles like analyticity and unitarity. So this, in some sense, um, uh, maybe you think you're not gonna learn too much from this, but it will provide a very important cross-check in our work because there's a number of uh, details that go into calculating these bounds. And I can say, for example, people have written down bounds in the literature um, that we discovered that actually 
are violated by certain well-behaved um, um, UV completions. And so it'll be a strong check that our bounds will not um, fall foul of these uh, con uh, constraints. And then finally, what I'm going to turn to is, of course, what is the real aim of analyzing, uh, applying these principles to the Smith, is what you can say about the phenomenology. But I just want to be honest up front, what you're going to see is that the bounds that we can place at this stage is on the dimension eight standard model effective field theory. And so the, the, the question that that begs is, well, why didn't we consider the dimension six? And as I'll try and highlight to you a little bit when we're going through um, uh, the, the review of the IR consistency arguments in section one, it's actually um, not so obvious how to set constraints on dimension six. These arguments are, are the cleanest for dimension eight and involve the minimal number of assumptions. That isn't to say you can and say nothing at dimension six. And so I'll give a hint about where the argument breaks down for dimension six, but it isn't what we've done in our work so far. So there will admittedly be this difficulty that intrinsically dimension eight operators are harder to search for than dimension six. I just wanna have that um, out of the way up front. It's certainly not something we're trying to hide. So let me first jump into this question of where are these um, constraints coming from? Why is it the fact that not every um, uh, effective field theory that you think you could write down consistent with the symmetries of your theory gives rise to a theory that is also um, consistent with other bedrock principles like unitarian analyticity? So this argument can be made quite generally, but I think it's useful when you're working through um, to think about a, a specific uh, theory, just to have um, a concrete example in mind. And for this purpose, one of the probably the simplest examples to discuss is let's just imagine we have a theory of a single massless scalar that's invariant under a shift symmetry so that we can um, kill off a number of possible operators. In such a theory, the um, leading interaction is given by this dimension eight um, relevant operator that I've written down here, this d phi to the fourth type term. And so what I wanna study is if you're just a, um, um, a Wilsonian effective field theorist, you would think that this C can take on any possible value uh, but as we'll see, this not um, certain values of C, in particular negative values of C, will give rise to a theory that's inconsistent with other principles that we usually want our theories to obey. So just to let you know, this argument of this d phi to the fourth um, uh, as falling foul of certain constraints, to the best of my knowledge, was first presented in this paper by Adams, Akani, Hamed, and collaborators back in 2006. But it, this is not where this story of um, uh, these basic ideas of unitarian analyticity constraining effective field theories began. To my knowledge, this, uh, this started much earlier in this work back in the 80s where people were using these ideas to constrain um, uh, chiral perturbation theory, for example. Uh, but specifically what I'll be, the discussion today will follow the, um, uh, the presentation in our, my most recent bosonic work with Grant. Good, so I want to tell you two different ways of thinking about um, how to constrain this, uh, this coefficient of this dimension eight operator. The first of these ways is I want to use analyticity and unitarity. And this argument I'll try and go through a bit more carefully than I will the second argument just um, for the uh, reasons of time. So the, the idea here is I'm going to, one, I want to connect this coefficient C to the imaginary part of the forward amplitude. And I'll go through um, uh, what the forward amplitude is in a second just to remind you. And then I'm going to use unitarity to connect the imaginary part of the forward amplitude to the cross section. And then essentially the argument will be because I've linked C to the cross section, as the cross section is positive, I'll be able to demand that C is positive, is how this is gonna work. But there's several details that I'll walk us through. So to begin with, as I said, the first step is I wanna connect the coefficient of the dimension eight operator to the forward scattering amplitude. So to do that, I need to calculate a scattering amplitude. So this is a, a good um, a reason why choosing this particularly simple theory was uh, worthwhile for doing a calculation on a slide. Uh, so what I, I just want to calculate is essentially, let's start out calculating the full scattering amplitude and then we'll take the forward limit. So let's calculate the scattering amplitude of this um, uh, two to two process and I'll just work in, um, uh, in kinematics where all the momenta are incoming. And also I'm using the mostly um, plus metric and so the Mandelstam invariants have uh, this form that I've got on the, to the right of the slide. So you just need to sit down, be careful about the fact these particles are identical and you can figure out what the amplitude is. Unsurprisingly, it, um, as a function of S and T, because U is an independent, uh, we have this form here, which is easy to verify. So then what we wanna do is take the forward limit. So if I think, um, uh, for example, that one and two are my incoming states and three and four are outgoing, what I'll need is P3 to go to minus P1 and P4 to go to minus P2. You can then check what that does to the, the Mandelstam invariance. Uh, you can see if you send P3 to minus P1, it goes to zero. S is unchanged and U because T has vanished goes to minus S. And so you can see that the, the S squared and the U squared terms have contributed, the T squared vanishes and you end up with this forward amplitude here. So next the idea is now that I have a forward amplitude in hand, 
I want to go and connect that to the um, uh, the co to the um, uh, the coefficient directly, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. But before I do do that, I just want to make a comment, and that is that you can see that this um, uh, this forward amplitude is an even function in S. Now you might have thought, okay, well that's obvious because I started with a dimension eight operator, so just by counting the uh, the mass dimension, uh, just to make uh, to compensate the m to the fourth, I had to have an S squared on the top because it's dimension eight, and that is indeed true. But actually, more generally, just from kinematic arguments, you would expect the forward amplitude to be an even function in S. And the reason for this is that if you impose crossing symmetry where you cross the one and three states, you can check that what this does is it swaps S to, um, to U, leaves T invariant, and because U is minus S minus T, in the forward limit, this tells you that the forward amplitude um, uh, must be an even function in S. So this already seems to impose a problem for the dimension six operators. Uh, by the same counting, I would expect them kinematically to scale as S. And so just by this crossing symmetry argument, I would expect them to vanish in the forward limit, which is what I'm going to use um, to connect to this coefficient. There is, however, a caveat to this argument. If my states are dressed with um, additional quantum numbers, and it's not just kinematics, so for example, if they had polarization vectors, the crossing symmetry doesn't just um, identify them, it also conjugates the um, uh, for example, these additional uh, quantum numbers, like the, the polarization vector, for example. And so it's no longer necessarily true that the function has to be purely even. You also need to account for that. Uh, but the argument isn't always as straightforward. For example, you have um, one amplitude minus a crossing version of it. And which one of those um, can appear in the UV? Generically, you could get both. Um, so it's not going to be obvious you'll be able to get a sign out. Uh, so I'm, I don't think the words I'm saying here are as clear as just having a look at uh, the details. And for that, I refer you to, for example, this Ian Lowe paper I'm, I'm mentioning down here. But this is just to say a, a hint as to why dimension six is a bit hard to do this and why you may need more assumptions to get beyond that. Good, so now let me go back to the main thrust of the argument, which is connecting this um, uh, C to the imaginary part of the amplitude. And to do this, I want to study this forward amplitude in the complex S plane. So I'm promoting S to be a complex variable. And why this is a useful thing to do is because from work beginning, going back to really the, um, uh, the analytic S matrix program back in the 60s, we have quite a good understanding of what the um, forward amplitude looks like in the complex S plane. In particular, there isn't just poles and branch cuts distributed uh, wildly throughout the, um, the plane, they're actually in locations which we have an understanding of. In particular, we know that um, on, there are uh, potentially poles and branch cuts along the positive S axis associated with one particle production or n particle branch cuts in the S channel. And there are also potentially um, poles and branch cuts in the, um, uh, in the negative S plane, which are associated with poles in the U channel, and because remember in the forward limit, U is minus S. And so generically, what we can just say is, let's just call this collection of poles and branch cuts to just generally be the discontinuity um, uh, across the, uh, the real axis here. But what's going to be critical to the argument is that there isn't some pole deep in the UV, in the imaginary plane, for example. So with this in mind, we can now use the residue theorem to isolate the coefficient of the dimension eight operator in the following way. Let's construct a contour, which is in some parametrically small s around the origin, and then we'll take an integral of the forward amplitude over s cubed. The reason we choose s cubed is because then um, for this dimension eight coefficient, this isolates the, the, um, uh, the coefficient as a simple pole, and so we can pull it out by the residue theorem. The reason why it's important to th think about a parametrically small size circle in S is because we want to think um, for those small values of S, we can sensibly uh, expand our forward amplitude as a series in S over some UV scale. And this is exactly what the, the standard model effective field theory or effective field theories in general are. So then we can sensibly think about picking out the, the coefficient of the effective field theory series. But then once we've made this identification, we can use the power of analyticity, our understanding of the analytic properties of the forward amplitude in this plane to change this contour. And that's what we're gonna do next. So the next step is we've now isolated this part, but then this must be true for any other contour that we can draw as long as we don't pass through any branch cuts or poles. And so the, the same um, uh, term must be extracted if we do this integral over this much larger contour, which I've labeled C prime here. In particular, as we push this out further and further, we can throw various terms out. This boundary term we can throw away as long as we assume our theory satisfies the Froissart bound, which is a pretty minimal assumption, which essentially says that the amplitude can't grow any faster than S log squared S. 
And in order to throw out the boundary, we just needed the amplitude to grow smaller than S squared, so this will be satisfied. So then what we're left with is that this um, uh, coefficient is related to an integral on either side of the, uh, the discontinuity, which I've defined um, below, uh, on the positive and negative S axis. Next, I'm going to invoke this crossing symmetry. And again, this is where things would change if you were trying to think about dimension six, but I've put that aside. I'm just focusing on dimension eight. And because the dimension eight part is even in S, I can link this part over the, this integral over the negative discontinuity to the positive discontinuity, which is what I have here. After this, um, from this formula down here, if I take this term and apply the, um, the Schwartz reflection principle, I can actually write the discontinuity in terms of um, uh, the imaginary part. There's a factor of a two and an i that appears, but um, uh, this is how I've been able to write this down. And now note that I've, I've achieved what I claimed I wanted to do earlier, where I've linked this coefficient to the imaginary part of the forward amplitude. And so now the result is primed to apply unitarity. Let's invoke the optical theorem, and we can link the imaginary part of the forward amplitude to S times the cross section. So the S, this is why this goes from S cubed to S squared. And we have this final result here. Now let's stare at this for a moment. The cross section, we know that's a positive definite quantity. Hey, Nick, you dropped out. Ah, sorry, where did I drop out? Uh, just when you said it's a positive quantity. Sorry. Good, yeah, no worries. Okay, so I think that that's the, um, uh, the critical part of this. What I was saying is that this final integral I have down here, the cross section is positive, S squared is positive, we're integrating it along here, so we're going to end up with a positive result. And so this is why um, uh, we, we can, we'll be able to say that this C that we started out has to be positive, because the only way um, uh, that this can occur, because n to the fourth and four are obviously positive, is that c has to be greater than zero. And so you can ask, well, well, how could have this gone wrong? How could I have a theory where c was negative? Well, one of the assumptions that was invoked in this argument must have fallen through. So maybe your theory violates locality or analyticity. Maybe it violates unitarity somewhere. But if it um, obeys those, then it must satisfy um, uh, this criterion. So of course I did the calculation here in the context of this simple scalar theory, but hopefully it's straightforward to see that if you just thought about a general effective field theory, um, the coefficient of the dimension eight operator for the forward sc scattering amplitudes, you can similarly demand to be positive, so you can generalize it. And in fact, you can also generalize these arguments to the case of fermions. So actually fermions um, in these positivity arguments have been very rarely discussed in literature. And um, the first result that showed you it should work um, in the same way, to my knowledge, was this um, work by Bellazzini in two, uh, 2016. Uh, and I think actually our work on the fermionic SMEFT is also one of the first ones to, um, to look at this in... ...and that to be positive by similar argument. So that is um, really what is going to the idea that is going to we're going to use again and again um, throughout our work. I'm not going to go through the argument every time, but I just wanted to lay out all the, the sort of guts of the argument um, uh, in front of you, so you can see where the meat of our results is coming from. Now, before um, I go on to show you how you're applying this, I promised you I would give you a second uh, a derivation of the, the same result using quite a different approach. And so this second um, uh, argument, which I'll go through uh, more quickly, but um, uh, I can point you to in directions if you want to read about this in much more detail, is I'm going to constrain the sign of C by using the classical equations of motion and the construction of a causal paradox. And so this has a very different flavor to the, the, the pr previous sort of much more quantum mechanical arguments that involved um, uh, basic principles like unitarity, and yet we'll arrive at the same answer. So this second type of argument, I think, was not appreciated earlier in the literature before this work by Adams et al. in 2006. Um, and the fact that these, um, uh, these results arrive at the same conclusion, and this, this occurs in, a, in an enormous way of the theories, uh, I think is somewhat um, remarkable and somewhat surprising that maybe there is some ad additional connection between causality and unitary, for example, than has been fully digested in the literature. So let me just quickly run through this argument. As, as stated, the first step is to calculate the classical equations of motion. For this particular theory, you can just crunch it, and this is what it looks like. And then the idea is we want to consider propagation of small perturbations of this, um, uh, of this phi field 
propagating in a, a non-zero background field of this a background condensate of the same field. And so we need um, uh, this background field because of course, in order to generate a, um, um, a correction to the propagation, we need to invoke this, uh, this higher dimension operator. Of course, the kinetic term will just give uh, light-like propagation. And so if we choose, for example, some simple condensate where it has a constant derivative, uh, we can just figure out what the dispersion relation looks like for this, um, uh, for this perturbation around this background field. And we'll find that um, the dispersion relation is such that the, perturb um, the perturbation is superluminal if C has a, um, a negative value. So if C is positive, you have a subluminal um, uh, propagations and everything looks the way you would expect. But if C is negative, uh, you can see you've essentially been pushed off the light cone in the wrong direction. So superluminal um, propagation of signals on its own isn't always enough to um, signal the breakdown of the causality of your theory. Uh, but as described in more detail than I want to go into right now in this paper here, if you, you can, uh, in these circumstances, actually construct a causal paradox. So usually if you just have, for example, you imagine you have like one bubble of the condensate, uh, this isn't enough on its own to necessarily construct a causal paradox because there's at least one um, frame where things are well-defined, which is the rest frame of the bubble. But if, for example, you have um, two bubbles of the condensate and they're flying past each other, you now lose any ability to go to a global frame where things are well-defined. And so there you can genuinely construct, um, for example, close time-like curves and therefore a proper causal paradox. And so the conclusion is that via this vastly different argument, you again are forced to think that C has to be positive, otherwise something goes terribly wrong with your theory. So again, um, especially in our bosonic... Uh, sorry, is there a question? Can I ask you a question? Uh, this Please. results to, um, to indicate something for uh, the value of C uh, with the mass of phi. I um, mean, for if phi is massless, shouldn't C be zero, for example? Um, and this should indicate that there is a relation between the mass of phi and the value of C because it should propagate uh, the speed of light. Yeah, not, not, not necessarily, right? You can sort of think about this as like um, a light propagating in a medium, right? You can think about this as inducing an index of refraction for the, um, uh, uh, for the, the, the scalar here. So just as, as light we know is mass, but it can still propagate at speed um, different to uh, the speed of light in various media. And we're essentially creating the same sort of argument here. And we're showing that unless the, um, uh, your effective field theory is constructed in a certain way, then in certain media, uh, if, hopefully that answers your question. If not, please um, uh, let me know. So let's answer the question. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Would you be able to repeat it? Yeah, you did answer my question. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Good. So that, that's the background. This is certainly, um, these results were certainly um, uh, not due to my work with um, uh, Grant. What I want to tell you now is how we use these ideas, um, which have, I think really in the literature found most of their application in formal context, and particularly, for example, uh, uh, high dimension operators associated with gravity. And we wanted to say, well, what can you use these same arguments for applied to the very phenomenologically relevant standard model effective field theory? So to begin with, let me tell you about the bosonic bounds. And the point of this slide here is just to emphasize that one of the real goals of our work was to be systematic. And if you have to be systematic in the dimension eight SMEF, you've got to think about a lot of operators, which is what we're showing you here. But I don't want to spend the time I have with you today going operator by operator through all the results. Um, I want to just focus on one representative example where life is sort of simplest, this, this sort of U1 hypercharge example. And I'll tell you about the flavor of the results that we were able to derive for hypercharge. And then I'll show you that our results can be bootstrapped to this much more general class of operators that we consider. And I'll just discuss that briefly. But just... Think about how to do each of these classes carefully because um, uh, there are a lot of details to keep track of. Good. So as promised, I say this is a warm up to the bosonic bounds, but it's sort of you know, most of what I want to talk about. 
Uh, Nick, so these dimension f to the fourth, and f f tilde. All right, yes. you you were frozen there for a minute or two. Ah, that is starting. Yes, starting on this slide. No worries. Um, so I said that what I want to focus on is um, U1 hypercharge, or analogously, you can just think about this as like the electromagnetism. And so if we're thinking about electromagnetism, what we have is in addition to the usual kinetic term, uh, the leading interactions are the following irrelevant operators. We have the famous Euler-Heisenberg type terms, F to the fourth and FF tilde all squared. And then in addition to the CP even terms, we also can write down a CP odd term, F cubed F tilde which I'm giving the coefficient C tilde. So let's think about what we can say about these various coefficients using these arguments that I described in section one. So let's think about the structure of these a little bit more. And what I should have emphasized just to, to, to let you know, the notation I'm using here is that the, the field strengths within these closed brackets are contracted as I have on the bottom right of the slide. So for this C1 type operator, I'm, I'm contracting um, uh, the, uh, the, the photon fields for exactly, um, are directly. Whereas for this FF tilde, I'm contracting them with a levi Civita because there's a levi Civita sitting in the Hodge dual. And so this tells me that um, for polarizations that are perpendicular, um, this C1 will vanish, whereas for polarizations that are parallel, uh, this C2 will vanish. So if I choose parallel polarizations, I can turn off um, C2 and I would expect that I'd be able to, by considering forward scattering, for ex of example, um, left-handed polarized photons, I should be able to argue that C1 is positive. Or by considering forward scattering of left and right-handed polarizations, these are perpendicular, I'll turn off C1, and I should be able to argue that C2 is positive. But what should we do about C tilde? C tilde sort of mediates inter, um, uh, scatterings where you have a left and a left go to a left and a right. And so this doesn't have a well-defined forward limit. So it's not completely obvious just at this simple level um, uh, whether we could say anything about C tilde. And just to let you know, these, these bounds on C1 and C2 were were calculated previously. These were done in this, um, this Adams et al. paper. And of course, you can check as a flavor of what we're going to get for the UV completions that in Euler-Heisenberg, where you integrate out the electron, of course, C1 and C2 are positive. Otherwise, all the things I'm telling you about wouldn't hold, um, hold any weight. So the, what we wanted to think about is how can, I mean, the whole approach here is we want to be systematic. Um, uh, with up to reasonable assumptions, we want to set as many bounds as we can. So how can we get at this C tilde? And sort of the intuition is these were two boundary limits where the, the polarizations were perpendicular or parallel. What, do we, what would happen if we had something in between? Well, then all three coefficients wouldn't necessarily be zero. And one, of course, we can just think about uh, polarizations that aren't necessarily parallel or perpendicular. But more generally, one way of obtaining that is, for example, thinking about superpositions of polarizations. And even though that might be overkill for what I'm doing here, this will be an argument that will be useful um, uh, as we go on, particularly in the fermionic case. So just to be um, specific at the moment, let's think about uh, polarizations at, a, um, uh, at an arbitrary angle from one another. So if I think about doing a forward scattering amplitude where the scatterers are heading in the Z direction, and I um, take one of the particles to have a polarization in the X direction, linearly polarized, and say I take the other one to be at some arbitrary angle theta from this, I can just simply calculate the following forward scattering amplitude. So as promised, if the um, polarizations are parallel, C1 is non-zero, the others are zero. And so the arguments I showed you earlier about the positivity of the S squared coefficient of the forward amplitude tell me C1 is positive. Similarly for C2 if they're perpendicular, but in a general, uh, for a general angle, all three of these are non-zero and I do get a constraint on C tilde. The question you now need to do, need to answer is, well, what is the best constraint you can get on C tilde? And for that, you need to marginalize over in theta and just determine what that is. So I, I don't think you might necessarily guess this ahead of time, but it turns out the strongest constraint you get is if you set theta to be arctan, the square root of the ratio of the other coefficients. And in this limit, you find that um, the product of the, the CP even coefficients bounds the square of the CP odd coefficient. And so one way of visualizing this constraint uh, is that the space of allowed coefficients for this U1 theory is you must live within this cone here. C1 and C2 have to be positive. C tilde does not have to be positive, but it must take a value such that it, um, your ultimate um, uh, quantities live within this cone. So in particular, for example, if either C1 or C2 was zero, C tilde must be zero. And so this is telling us that there's some interplay, at least at this level, between CP even effects and CP odd effects, where the CP odd ones just cannot be arbitrarily large, otherwise they'll fall foul of these um, bounds. So that was what happens for this simple case. I'm getting told my internet was unstable. So let me know if I cut out. Um, that was what, 
Yes, please. Sorry. Uh, it seems to me, so suppose that you take the born in felt action rather than Euler Heisenberg. Yep. If I remember correctly, in these cases, the C1 and C2 become negative. So I don't, I don't think that's actually the case. So I don't have it on my slides here, but we did do born in felt in, um, okay. in our paper. Uh, we show that when you actually um, look at the low energy theory, you get out like small values of the, um, the electric and uh, magnetic fields, you'll see that again, you get positive values. So I, I believe that these ones are also satisfy um, uh, our constraints. I, this was discussed in our bosonic paper. It's one of the UV completions we discussed. I, unfortunately, it's not one I'll discuss in this talk here. But, well, it would be uh, maybe the same case also for the scalar case for uh, DB at the Dirac. Well, anyway, the scalar bar in felt. So even in that case, you believe that it does satisfy the constraint? Uh, maybe the, yeah, the, yeah that, that, that's right. Um, DBI satisfies the constraint. That was That's in the original Adams paper. Okay, okay, so maybe there is just an extra minus sign. Yeah, in this case, for this nonlinear electrodynamics, the C, C tilde is uh, zero, right? Because that's my memory. That's the amplitude right. satisfies helicity, so you don't have any mixed terms like that. Yes, right? but you, you, can, you can generate this. So actually, I, um, for time constraints, I don't think I'll, I will go through this today, but I have a backup slide on it. So one of the UV completions we, we discussed in our paper is that if you have... So if I just go back to this slide to make this point a bit clearer, if you had, for example, just an axion coupled to FF tilde, if I integrate that out, I'll generate C2. If I had a dilaton coupled to F squared and I integrate that out, I'll get C1. So to get C tilde, one theory you can have is you can have an axion and a dilaton that mix. And C tilde there is generated by the mixing between them. And then you can actually see the reason why this constraint arises in this particular theory is that the mixing, of course, can't be arbitrarily large. It can't give rise to a larger effect than the um, the diagonal couplings. Um, but more generically, we're, we're finding that this is true. And we'll also see in the fermionic case, the, the, the results actually seem to be even stronger than this, which I'll, I'll come to shortly. But again, just, just to sort of add to an, the answer to your question, um, to my knowledge, there, there are no examples of like well def, like um, usual UV completions that violate these bounds. There are some perturbations people have done to gravity, for example, like the um, DGP theory of gravity, which fall foul of these constraints. But most usual UV completions people will discuss um, absolutely satisfy these bounds, is at least to, the, to my knowledge. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question. Good, so now, now that I've gone through the warm up, what I want to tell you about in much less time is what we spent a lot of the work on the paper in. And this is extending this to this full set of bounds, um, a full set of operators I showed you earlier. So of course, the first step when you're studying a large set of, uh, a, a, um, when you're studying the effective field theory is to make sure you have a consistent basis. And as I'm sure most people here are aware, this is a problem that has plagued the field for a long time and has only really started to become um, under control in the, the era of these Hilbert series methods where we can really get the counting down pat. But while, for example, at dimension six, the, the basis has been um, uh, uh, fully constructed in this famous Warsaw basis paper, at dimension eight, it is not yet the case that the full basis has been constructed. The number of operators of each type are known, but it is not even the case that we know how many CP even and CP odd operators of each type there should be. And so constructing the basis is often something that is work left to be done. So this is work that we had to tackle here, although we're able to re rely on some partial results in the literature. So firstly, we had to construct um, pure field strength type operators, like if you just have this B to the fourth, W to the fourth, and gluon to the fourth operators. And then we also thought about uh, mixed operators, like um, if you have B squared, W squared, for example. So we actually constructed these on our own. You need to be careful about using various identities, the shooting identity, various levi Savita, all the color identities. But after we'd constructed the basis and confirmed that it agreed with the number we thought, we realized that actually there was this paper, nice work by Morozov back in the uh, uh, 1980s where he had actually constructed the general basis for an SUN theory. Uh, so th we were certainly not the first people to do that, we realized after this paper, we found this paper here. Although to our knowledge, we are the first to construct the, the, um, the cross cortic operators I'm showing you on the right. As we wanted to think about the full bosonic SMEFT, uh, if we added, we need to add Higgs operators into this, and at dimension eight, we're actually able to rely on the nice uh, result of Hayes et al from uh, 2018, where they constructed these operators. So we lifted their results um, for our purposes here. And then we had to think carefully about um, uh, this scattering in these more general cases than just the U1. You need to think about marginalizing over um, 
uh, the various uh, colors that can, can arise. And you also need to think carefully about how you avoid various other operators. So in the U1 case, the first um, uh, self interactions we can get are at dimension eight, but for um, uh, non-abelian theories, that's obviously not true. So you need to think carefully about how you can isolate the coefficient of uh, the dimension eight operator. I don't want, I'm not going to go into that in detail today, but I'm happy to answer questions if people are interested. Uh, but just to tell you when, we, when the dust settles, we arrived at 27 independent bounds. But what is interesting is they all came out in this flavor of that we saw in the U1 case. Either we had some combination of the CP even coefficients together must be positive, or we were finding some combination of the CP odd coefficients when squared are bounded by a product of the CP even coefficients. So you can see that the U1 case I described is uh, embedded in this full list, but we found many other uh, constraints and also constraints on the, the Higgs operators as you're showing here. So one caveat to the results that we presented here, even though we've obtained a large number of bounds, is that we only thought about scattering definite representations. We didn't think about superpositions of, for example, a Higgs and um, a W boson. If you did that, you could um, uh, obtain additional bounds beyond what we actually did. Uh, but we, from some testing, and we discussed this a bit in our paper, it becomes clear that the bounds look like they're going to become um, much more complicated very quickly. For example, they'll involve many more operators in terms of what um, is positive. And actually, you can show that the problem of finding the minimal bounds associated with the scattering of these superpositions is actually an NP-hard problem. So this isn't to say you can't make progress on it, and it would be an interesting direction to look at in the future. But just to let you know, we're not claiming at this point that this is the full set of bounds you can set on this. Um, space of operators, but it is in some sense probably the, the set of uh, most simple bounds you're likely to be able to get out. So now let me do the same sorry, thing. Sorry. Can I ask a question? Of course, please. That's a curious question. You have 10 to the 8 bound. How long does it take you to, to calculate the whole bound? Is it very complicated? No, no, thank you for this. This was actually a point that I, I didn't mention. So the these 27 independent bounds, so there's, it's 27 bounds, it's definitely not 10 to the eight bounds. Um, but what you can think about this as is, and thanks for asking, because I forgot to mention this, is if you want to impose a prior on the standard model effective field theory, you can think about each of these bounds as like cutting some parameter space in half. So in some sense, you're getting um, a 10 to the eight reduction in the prior space of the standard model effective field theory. So you, okay, okay, okay. you can take so, that as you want. You know, thanks for clarifying. It's definitely not 10 to the eight bounds. That would have been an impressive achievement. We were very happy with 27. Okay, okay, I understand, thank you. Thank you. Good, so let me now um, uh, tell you the same story on the fermionic side. And again, I think just to try and give you the, um, really the, the core of, of the, the physics that's going on here, let me focus again on what I think is probably the simplest operator or case here. And that is, let's think about scattering of just right-handed electrons. And we're working in the unbroken standard model. And the reason this is simple is because these are the only um, fields that are uncharged under um, uh, uh, color and um, weak isospin, which means that the structures here are much simpler to work with. But even then, um, and so I'll discuss the, the completeness of this operator basis in a moment, even then we only have one operator, but actually it's um, multiple operators in the sense that we can have flavor structure, which we know exists in the standard model. So what I'm writing here is these MNPQ indices are indexing the flavor, which in, uh, arbitrarily can go um, from one to NF, but we know in the standard model that NF is three. So of course, again, if I wanna start thinking about forward scattering associated with this dimension eight operator, again, it has to be dimension eight as mentioned. Um, uh, you can ask, well, is this even a complete basis? It looks like you've just written down one operator up to the flavor structure. So you might think, well, let's just count how many operators and compare it to the known results. You might think that actually there's um, NF to the fourth complex coefficients here because there's four indices, so two NF to the fourth real coefficients, but of course they're not all independent. Um, the Lagrangian needs to be Hermitian, so that sets this constraint here. And then in addition, uh, this set of this bilinear and this bilinear are identical, so if I swap MN and PQ, I better get the same result. So the, actually the combination of these two constraints tell us that instead of having two NF to the fourth operators, we have NF squared um, times NF squared plus one over two operators. And then what we can do is go and look up, for example, the appendix of um, one of these Hilbert series papers where they listed how many operators, but of course, to remind you, they didn't construct the basis. Um, to our knowledge, we're the first to do this. Um, and they, we can see that in this case, we have exactly the right number of operators. So I think it's very nice that this simple operator gives you all the operators you need to think about if you're just scattering right-handed electrons. 
Good, so then what we wanna do is do the forward scattering of right-handed electrons. I won't go through the calculation in, in detail like I did um, earlier on in the talk. It turns out that because I'm doing forward scattering and I wanna think about superpositions of flavors to get at some structure of this, this matrix here, I just need to specify what the superposition is um, for the one and two state because the three and four states will be identified. Uh, the way we calculate this is um, because we're thinking, working in a, the, uh, a chiral theory of the standard model, you, we use spinolicity methods to calculate it, but um, there's, uh, at the end of the day, what we get when we do that calculation is this forward scattering amplitude I have here. And so again, the argument is that the, the coefficient of S squared must be positive. And so we find that this CMNPQ, alpha M, um, alpha Q star, beta N, beta um, P star has to be positive. Now, actually one way of thinking about this, or just another way of phrasing the same, the same constraint, is that alpha M and alpha Q star can be combined actually into a pure density matrix. And this is because they're idempotent and uh, have trace one. So actually another way of phrasing the constraint is that this, this matrix, when con contracted with two arbitrary um, densi pure density matrices, must be positive. So that's a short way of saying what's there, but maybe it doesn't leave you with a ton of intuition. What is the constraint on these matrices, on the, the coefficients of these matrices that are gonna be satisfied by this? So let me try and in the next few slides, give you some intuition that actually the space has some interesting structure to it. So firstly, let's just do some simple examples, starting out with not even thinking about superpositions. Let me just say um, the one state is an electron and the two state is a muon. Well, then I just find some coefficient that has to be positive. If I said one, and, uh, one was an electron, three was a tau, I'd also get a constraint. So you get something a bit more interesting, again, superpositions are the name of the game. And so if I now let the, the two state be a superposition of a muon and a tau, and I marginalize over the superposition, I get a constraint that looks um, uh, very familiar. It looks very much like our cone constraint. And just to give you some physical um, addressing to these results here, what we have in this first case, or is in the one, two, two, uh, one operator, is sort of mu electron scattering, but it's flavor conserving. For the second one, it's tau electron scattering, um, but it's flavor conserving. But what we have in this final case is a flavor violating type of scattering that has no well-defined forward limit on its own, but we can access it through scattering superpositions. And so now what we're finding is that flavor violating effects appear to be bounded by flavor conserving effects. And you can go through a similar argument for other types of flavor um, violating effects. And you see that this is a, a story that seems to come true in all of the operators we consider. So again, this has the structure of this cone type um, uh, constraint we saw in the bosonic sector. And actually there is a link to CP. Uh, you can show for the operators we have here uh, that CP violation is tied to um, uh, flavor violation. And so only the flavor violating operators can actually mediate CP violating interactions. So again, by constraints like this, the CP violation is also bounded by CP conserving effects. Another thing you might ask is that in flavor models, especially as we go to the UV, there are many, of, uh, many types of structures we often try and impose on our theories to ensure that they're consistent with the very stringent constraints there are on flavor violating effects. So for example, um, a common assumption is that the UV um, physics might obey something like minimal flavor violation, where all the flavor violating effects are associated with the, the standard model be uh, But actually you can check that the bounds, that the, the, the impositions on the flavor structure we place with our bounds are orthogonal to things like minimal flavor violation and other flavor assumptions as far as we're aware of them in the literature. And what I mean by orthogonal in this sense is that our bounds don't impose, imply minimal flavor violation and MFV doesn't Im imply our bounds. So we've seen that this same structure is emerging, but actually this isn't the full structure that this contraction with two density matrices impose. There's more structure here. And let me just try and emphasize that to you with a simple example on the next slide. So what I'm gonna do in this example is I'm gonna take some really um, uh, over the top in some sense of simplifying assumptions. But the reason I'm doing this is just because um, obviously there's many coefficients in these operators. And so to, in order to plot them in a useful sense, I need to make a number of uh, simplifying assumptions to link these. But even under these assumptions, we're gonna find that a, um, a non-trivial uh, structure emerges. So again, just restricting attention to this, e, um, this right-handed electron operator, let me restrict my attention to the case where we have two flavors. Additionally, I'll impose CP conservation, which just to remind you means that all the coefficients have to be real. And then I'm gonna take all the coefficients that fall into similar classes and identify them. So flavor conserving coefficients that have a forward limit, I'll say just have uh, C. Flavor conserving coefficient that doesn't have a forward limit, I'll call C naught. So what actually, just to let, let you know what I mean by this, this is an operator that mediates scattering, scattering of the form um, mu, mu, mu mu bar or mu plus mu minus goes to E plus E minus. 
So um, of course that conserves flavor, but it, um, uh, it has no well-defined forward limit. So that's what I mean by C naught. And because it doesn't have a well-defined forward limit, you wouldn't expect necessarily we can force it to be positive as we should all the, the, um, uh, the coefficients that I call C. Then for the one and two flavor violating operators, I'll also identify them as such. So now let's figure out what the bounds are. You won't be surprised to find that C has to be positive. I'm more interested in the structure imposed on these coefficients down here. In order to reveal that, it's helpful to define um, uh, this Xi, which is the Ci over Cs, because we know that gener generally the Cs will bound um, uh, the Cis. And then if we plot various slices, um, or projections, sorry, of this space, uh, we have uh, the, the three plots that I show you at the bottom. So it's still a 3D space because they're C0, C1, C2, but this is giving you a flavor of the structure. So instead of just a cone type structure, you can see it's almost an ice cream cone structure that is um, emerging here. And you can imagine that as we go to um, re relax various assumptions here, the, the, the exact boundary of the SMEF that's being mapped out by these constraints uh, can become even more non-trivial. Good, so now let me just briefly tell you um, about what, what again was where a lot of the work was um, in this paper, which was extending these ideas more systematically throughout the full fermionic SMEF. Again, we re restricted our attention to only scattering definite representations. So we never took a superposition of, for example, a right-handed electron and a left-handed quark field. Uh, if you did this, you could again um, get additional bounds. And actually interesting in, in, in this case, is likely you could potentially set a bound on baron and lepton number violating effects. But we put that aside for the moment and we just focused on the, um, the definite representations because there was already this interesting story in terms of flavor emerging. So again, what you needed to do is construct the um, full set of operators. Uh, in this case, um, the self-cortic operators, which is like this e to the fourth operator I've been discussing, have this form here, uh, where, for example, there are various derivative of um, uh, these uh, fermion bilinear currents um, uh, for the, the different fields of the standard model. And then additionally, if you have cross-cortics, which is where you have um, uh, two of one field and two of the other, uh, you have the same type of operators here as the OJs, but then there's an additional type of um, uh, structure, um, uh, these Ks here, which you can actually show is linked to the um, stress energy tensor for these fermions. Okay, so that, that's just the basis. We check that we had the right counting and that it agreed with the Hilbert series methods. We then crunch our, um, we then just run this through the, the procedure of calculating the forward scattering amplitudes and requiring the coefficient to be positive, and we, we achieve bounds on many of the operators I showed you here. And again, what, I'm, what I talked about was just this CE1 um, alpha beta, but it's similar story will hold for each of these, where each of these quantities will require to be positive. Good, so that's now described to you all the bounds that we derived in our two papers. Let me just give you some uh, check that we've done to make sure that our bounds aren't uh, completely nonsense. And, and that is to say that uh, if you take any sensible UV completion, because we know that the, in the UV, this theory is um, uh, analytic and um, unitary, et cetera, et cetera. If I then integrate states out, I should arrive at an effective field theory that satisfies our bounds. And so this will be a non-trivial check, because as I mentioned, we, there were works in the literature where the, the bounds that they quote are not satisfied by um, some of the results that we derived here. Um, good, excellent. So this is just to reiterate this idea that we're just trying to get a, 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 a cross-check on the work that we have. So let me start out with um, a simple case for the fermions. And, and just to say ahead of time, I'm only going to go through two sort of um, uh, examples, one for the fermions, one for the bosons. We actually discussed many more in our paper. So if there's interest, please have a look there. So for the fermions, one way you can actually imagine generating a, a dimension eight um, uh, operator of the type we've been talking about is if you integrate out a, um, a KK graviton. So the way that you would imagine um, this would couple um, to our fermions is through, the, of course, through the, the field strength tensor. And just for simplicity here, let's just consider the, um, the coupling to the right-handed electron, again, just to make the, uh, the work simpler for, on the slide. So now if I imagine that this is some massive graviton field, I can integrate it out and see what um, uh, is left afterwards. And indeed, actually what we get is a dimension eight operator, which is exactly this, um, uh, this derivative of these two bilinear currents that I showed you earlier on of this e to the fourth operator. And you come out with a coefficient matrix which has this form here. It's um, uh, diagonal in the various flavors as written. And then the question is, does this satisfy our bounds? Remember the requirement is that if I can track this, this matrix of flavors with uh, two uh, pure state density matrices, then it must always be positive. So I can just do this. And then you find that um, you have this result here. And then by the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, you're confident that um, uh, for any density matrices you could have chosen, this is positive. So that's a, a tick that actually the result that we have here satisfies these bounds. 
Let me, for the boson case, I think the, the idea that you might have in mind for what would generate this is sort of a, a generalization of Euler-Heisenberg, because of course that is the canonical example of the type of operators I'm, I'm discussing in the bosonic sector. And so if we want to generate the, many of the other operators we discussed, we, we of course can't just think about operators that are charged under a U1 hypercharge. I need to think about integrating out a general particle that is charged under some arbitrary representation of the standard model. It can be in some arbitrary um, representation of, of color, a weak isospin, and have an arbitrary hypercharge. And the question is, if I integrate out such a, 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 um, a field, what is the coefficient of operators that, that I get? So you can imagine there are a lot of operators, um, uh, there are a lot of possible different charges. Uh, this could uh, quickly become uh, somewhat complicated. Uh, and just to let you know that is correct, and this is the result. Um, and so, but just to give credit where it's due, because this was in a very impressive piece of work, where these uh, coefficients are coming from is this beautiful paper by Quevillon and collaborators that came out in uh, late 2018. So what they actually did here is they calculated this monster generalization of Euler-Heisenberg, where they said, if you integrate out a complex scalar, a fermion or a vector with some arbitrary charge under the standard model, what is the coefficient of, um, a high, of the high dimension operators that you induce? We took their results, mapped them to our basis because we use slightly different bases, uh, and then we were able to write this down here. And now the question is, I'll, I'll describe what some of these things are in a moment, but the, the, the challenge here is, is are these things gonna be positive? So just to let you know what you're looking at, uh, Q is the, the U1 hypercharge. So if your field was charged under hypercharge, you're not surprised to see that you get these um, uh, Euler-Heisenberg type terms. But then this R2 and this R3 are the representation of the um, SU2 and SU3 uh, charges. And these additional objects are various group theory invariants. And so you can see that there are minus signs appearing here. Additionally, these group theory invariants aren't all positive definite, in particular I3 can be negative. And so this raises the stakes that if we need various combinations of these to be positive, it's not necessarily definite ahead of time that it has to work out that way. But when you crunch the numbers, you find that the way that our bounds occur is that various combinations of these enter together and these cancel out all of the, um, uh, the minus signs and you're left that no matter what representation you're in, our bounds are satisfied. And so again, this is a very non-trivial check because we had found bounds placed in, the, in this space, in a subset of this space in the literature which violated some of these constraints. Good, so as I said, there's many other UV completions um, that, that are discussed in our uh, paper. That was just to give you a flavor that we have checked many and in every case um, uh, found that our bounds are satisfied. Uh, let me spend the last few minutes giving you a flavor of what you might be able to do in terms of the phenomenology of these results. So to begin with, as I said right at the outset, I'm not trying to shy away from the fact that our bounds apply to dimension eight operators. And although I think there's some very nice structure in our bounds, we do not have some fundamental new way of getting around the complexity of the, the reality that dimension eight operators are more difficult to probe than dimension six. That isn't to say that there is nothing you can do here, as I'll give you a flavor for today. There are existing LHC searches for dimension eight operators, but it certainly raises the stakes that it will be interesting to think what you could do at the dimension six stage. With that caveat aside, let me tell you about sort of what you can do with the two types of bounds we have. And I've already hinted at least at some of this throughout the work. In particular, for these positivity bounds, we go back to this picture I showed you earlier on. You can view these in two ways. One, you can think of them as applying a prior on the, the SMEF parameter space. And as people are doing even now um, global searches of the SMEF, if they ever um, start extending that to include the dimension eight space, then our prize become immediately relevant. But I think more excitingly is the possibility that if we see a deviation uh, and it can be attributed to dimension eight, uh, then you, if you could measure the sign, there's a lot of ifs here, but if you were able to get there, you could potentially say something about whether the, um, the new physics that's emerging satisfies these basic assumptions we usually would have of um, UV physics, which I think is a remarkable possibility. Additionally, I think there's a, a, a new flavor of, of bounds that we're getting out here. I, I'd say that this, this idea about testing these bedrock principles through the sign was something that had been mentioned in previous works, but I think what is really new in our um, uh, results is this, this interplay between violation and conservation in both CP and flavor. And so just to give you a, an example of what you might actually be able to do here is that, so one of the types of operators we have, um, uh, these, uh, G, these gluon to the fourth type operators, there are CP violating variants of these. And you can check that of course, these objects are able to generate, for example, a non-zero neutron EDM. And if um, coming generations of um, uh, measurements of the neutron EDM actually detect a definitive signal, you can, we can test whether this is coming from dimension eight in the following sense. 
If these coefficients are non-zero, that tells me that certain CP even coefficients must be non-zero, which tells me that the associated CP um, even operators must be there at a given magnitude at least. And so you can go and search for that. And so this raises the, the stakes that as soon as you see something in a neutron EDM experiment, you may be able to test it directly by looking for um, deviations in the tails of dijet distributions. Now, looking for deviations due to a dimension eight operator in the tails of dijet distributions is a very difficult thing to do, although there have been papers um, discussing that this may well be possible. Uh, but at least this is just a flavor of how this could be done. In the fermionic sector, if you saw some deviation um, associated with a flavor violating an effect, you could test whether it's coming from dimension eight because there must be this totally independent of your model. As long as the UV physics that's giving rise to it obey these bedrock principles, there must be a flavor conserving effect you can go and search for. There are various techniques you can do to try and tease out dimension eight operators. Uh, some of these effects give rise to different angular structures you can get from dimension six. Uh, the effects tend to grow in a different way compared to dimension six at, um, at, um, in the high energy tails. But this is just to say it can be done of course, again, it will be difficult. Um, so let me, just to give you um, more of a concrete rather than this, this sort of aspirational discussion, um, uh, realization of what we've done is, as I said, there are existing LHC searches for dimension eight operators. So just in the last minute or so of my talk, let me tell you about how you can map our bounds directly onto this. Um, and as we do this, we'll see one of the, the, the challenges that arises in this space. And so for this, what I'm gonna talk about is the anomalous quartic gauge couplings in the standard model. And so couplings like uh, 4W or 2Ws and 2Zs uh, can be uh, received contributions from these dimension eight operators. And actually both ATLAS and CMS have an ongoing search where they look at constraining dimension eight coefficients are using exactly these effects. And for a nice review of this topic, I refer to this green mead and player paper down here. Good, so again, if you're gonna do a, a, um, an experimental search, just as like when we were doing our study, the first thing you need is a basis for these operators. And to let you know, in this space, this was the basis of operators people had been using. It was based off this work by Oli and collaborators back in 2006. Uh, and they wrote down, there were two scalar operators. These are the Higgs, purely Higgs type operators. There were eight mix, so Higgs and gauge boson, and then 10 tensor operators. So um, uh, these are the uh, purely um, field strength type operators. So as um, the, the, this, uh, st these studies progressed, although I'll let you know that actually the experiments are still using this basis here, there was realized that there were some problems in this basis. So for example, uh, in the years since, um, uh, there was a review of this in uh, this paper here, they realized that there was a missing scalar operator, that one of these mixed operators was actually identical to another one, and that two of these tensor operators um, are actually identically zero. So I'm not putting this here to call out the work of Abolia now. They were the ones who realized that these searches were a powerful way of probing these dimension eight effects. I think it was just more than in the entire field, constructing these bases has been a, a challenging uh, problem for a long time before these Hilbert series methods came along. But actually what we needed to do as a first step is map our basis onto this set here. And when we did this, we found that even the basis that has been updated in the literature is still incomplete. So our basis, which, which we're confident in, actually has um, three additional operators beyond what was being used. So actually some of our bounds can't be mapped to this space because they're related to operators that do not appear in this list, but several can. And so just to give you a flavor of that. So CMS has actually looked for um, uh, these two operators here, which are related to these Higgs operators down the bottom. And our bound when mapped onto this space says that this CS0 can only be positive, but on its own, it doesn't constrain CS1. And so for example, for the existing constraint, we can place a theory prior as claimed exactly onto this space. And we can also put more interesting structures onto the space. For example, we have this set of um, constraints on these uh, tensor type operators, uh, which we can put here, but the um, uh, experimentalists have not yet done a, a 2D scan of this space at the moment, but if they did, this would be the prior we put on. So that's just to give you a slightly more um, uh, mature version of the type of phenomenological um, implications of our results that I um, uh, was hinting at. Okay, so with that, that, that was the list of topics I wanted to describe today, so let me wrap up. And just to tell you that what Grant and I have been doing recently is just beginning to explore um, the, the, the systematic effects that these results um, can impose on the standard model effective field theory. And I think already we're uncovering some really interesting results. In particular, I'm excited about this connection between the disparate experiments. I think it would be very interesting to think about in more detail whether you, if a neutron EDM actually was measured, whether it is plausible to actually pull out the associated CP even effect of the LHC. Um, and if so, I think that would be a very interesting uh, study that could be done if a result turned up. Additionally, though, as I mentioned, there's many other directions we could take. Thinking about superpositions of representations with a view towards baron lepton number violet um, operators. Thinking about, um, for example, extensions to the standard model. If you had like another light field, such as an axion, you could also 
derive bounds on the, um, uh, the story there. And then another thing that I think is certainly worth thinking about carefully with uh, phenomenology in, in mind is what can you say at dimension six? The story must change. As I hinted at, uh, the arguments break down somewhat and you probably need to make additional assumptions. But maybe it would be interesting to study that if the sort of results we're finding, can they be lifted to dimension six uh, under reasonable assumptions? Or is it, will it be the case that a generic UV uh, theory will violate our constraints of dimension six? I think that would be very interesting to understand. Okay, so with that, uh, let me leave it there. Thanks for your attention. Okay, questions. So uh, I, have, I have a question. Um, you know, one, one thing that um, uh, I've been thinking about a bit um, in phenomenology that I wonder if this could possibly say anything about, you know, you can, um, there's some uh, effort being put into looking for a coupling like uh, TT Higgs Higgs, okay? So an actual point-like coupling that has TTHH, okay? Now, um, you know, that's a coupling that's not there in the standard model. Um, now, in any sort of reasonable model that I know about, if you, mod if you generate a TTHH, you would also modify TTH, right? Okay, yeah. and so, you know, searching for an anomaly in TTH would be more sensitive generically, okay? But, you know, you could say, look, you know, let's, let's, you know, it's worthwhile doing the search anyway, right? Maybe there's a cancellation, okay? Because you could have, for example, dimension six and dimension eight ad, uh, operators cancel so that TTH looks standard model-like, but TTHH does not. But I'm wondering if maybe that would be subject to the kinds of constraints that you're talking about. Yeah, so, um, so the, the difficulty here is that you really, at, at the level at which we're working at, you can really only apply this to dimension eight operators. And it's actually even, it's even worse than that in some senses. It, it's a dimension eight operators with a sufficient number of derivatives because you need to get this S squared term out, for example. So if you just had um, a dimension eight operator that was just you know, Higgs to the eight or something like this, you're not going to um, be able to get an S squared uh, coefficient out of this. And so then th this argument breaks down because I wasn't able to isolate that out. But potentially with the operator you told me, if I dress it with a certain number of derivatives, um, uh, I can get out what I, I can say something about this and th it'll be exactly the same sort of story <laughs> I assume it's what we've done here, although just to let, of course, we haven't considered the mixed bosonic and fermionic case. That's another possible um, extension. But I think, I think sort of questions in the direction of what you're going, I think what the way that I would tackle that is to start thinking about this dimension six story, or just more generally away from dimension eight. Um, because it's not, it's, it, I haven't gone into all the details here, but it looks like if you make some additional assumptions about the type of interactions you can have in the UV, you can again arrive at a positivity story for dimension six. And if people just haven't thought about this systematically, this I would refer you to this low paper where they looked at just Higgs operators and looked at what you could say dimension six using these types of approaches. But if I wanted to think about a TTHH type operator, I'd need to think about that more generally. So I can say that I, with what we've done here, so to the, the summarize what I answered your question, what we've done here, I can't tell you about that particular operator unless I dress it with some number of derivatives. But that isn't to say that this, this, this approach can't tell you anything. And I really think that the, that uh, question just hasn't been studied systematically yet. And so I really think that's an interesting uh, future direction. Can I, can I just ask a follow-up question? Please. Sorry. So can you just remind me, yeah, you reminded me that there's this issue with derivatives, but can you remind me, so is, for example, if I wanted to just try to use these methods to just constrain, say, uh, higher powers of H, say, just in a scalar theory. I just have H, you know, some scalar to higher and higher powers. There's not really any way to constrain those powers because something is not a derivative term. Uh, not, okay, so at least with the exact argument I presented here, not to my knowledge, because the way the argument proceeds is you th think about a forward scattering limit. And so if I'm doing two to two scattering from some 
eight to the eight operator, I have to give four of them devs, for example. And so that will make up the dimension. But then that won't, when I go through this argument, this, this, these VIVs aren't picked out as a simple poll. Yeah. And you have system. to pick out. So that's already, these kinds of things I'm talking about, they're not, yeah, they, they, they're, they're non-zero at zero external momenta. So it's yes, hard to exactly. use these arguments. Yeah, yeah. I, I it's, yeah. So again, um, I, I can't tell you what the ex exact extent of these um, uh, results are yet because it just isn't known. Um, but I can tell you, at least at the way we apply at the moment, I, I can see there'd be some difficulties here unless you have some derivatives involved. Or fermions, which of course secretly have um, powers of the momenta inside them. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, can we go back to your first calculation? Oh. Complex plane? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So if I had a unstable resonance, there'd be a pole that's off the axis. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Good. So this, yeah. So this is actually an interesting question. Where, so I mean, I I do not appreciate all the details here, but just to let you know, you know, especially back in the '60s and in the, in, in the number of years since, people have understood an enormous amount about what these things look like in the complex plane. So um, your question is that if I had an unstable resonance, of course, a associated with the width, I would think this is sitting somewhere off the, the real axis. Right. Actually, though, it's not sitting on this plane. There's actually, because there's, there's like multiple planes, um, uh, because there's this branch cut here, the unstable thing is actually sitting on a separate plane to watch I'm, I'm doing the, the integration here. And I, um, if you actually look up the PDG, I was just looking at this the other day. If you look up the PDG um, description of resonances, they actually draw out the complex plane for the case of an unstable resonance and show you what the two um, uh, show you what the the, the two um, uh, spaces look like and how they join. And you can see where this resonance is sitting, but it's actually off the, the it's like on the the plane below what I'm doing yeah. the integral on. It's on another sheet. It's on another sheet is the term I'm searching for. Thank you. Yeah. You yeah, know that that's a very good question. I, I I was thinking about this, and that that is um, people had they just had thought a lot about these things back in the day. Yeah. Any other questions? If you have even higher dimensional operators, so that will affect the result. You have a ten four dimension eight. Coefficients. I mean, for example, they can produce even higher power as the zero argument will go through. Uh, yeah, so the argument here will go through because, um, uh, for example, I've isolated the dimension eight as a simple pole, and then all I'm relying on to kill off the boundary term is the Froissart bound. So it will go through there. But I think to flip your question, if you had higher operators, actually you can set more constraints. And so there are these. Um, uh, beyond positivity type bounds where at, um, uh, you can also set constraints outside the forward limit where you only have non-zero T values as well. But my memory is that usually they come in at like dimension 10, for example, or you can bound operators of the form like S squared times T. And then additionally, I believe that there are, are more constraints that are, are coming out of some uh, work by uh, Nehmer and collaborators uh, in this method called the EFT hedron. So I, I must admit, I don't know too much about that. It's, the paper's not out, although I believe that there are um, a number of talks online that, that give a flavor for this. But generically, for as, once you go beyond dimension eight, there are a number of other constraints you can set on this. Um, and so in various contexts, these are, are particularly interesting. But I think for our phenomenology study, um, uh, going higher than dimension eight is probably not the, the, the most useful next step to do. How would you... Uh implement this procedure in, uh, let's say, Carl perturbation theory, when these higher, op uh, higher dimensional operators uh, at three level actually mix with the loop amplitudes with fewer insertions or based on the Weinberg formula, you have a rule which you, have, which you can insert how many times. So would you, would you have to combine the loop amplitudes with, say, 
OP2, coupling constants with the three level amplitudes with OP6 and then apply on it or uh, how would that work? That's actually a really good question. I don't know the answer offhand, but I know this. So Carl perturbation, perturbation theory was actually, as I mentioned, the first application of this in this, this paper. And then also, also it was rediscussed in this 2006 NEMA paper. So yeah, I'm not exactly sure how the interplay between those two would work here. Um, of course, you would need to think about it carefully. Maybe you could think, no, I, I don't, it's not obvious to me how you would separate them um, at the moment. So I, I can't say more here, but I would have a look in the, the NEMA paper. Near the end of it, they describe chiral perturbation theory. But yeah, that's an excellent question. The, the, the claim is you can say something. It, I, I don't believe you can just say nothing. So I, I just can't remember how that subtlety is resolved. But. Yeah, the, the question is uh, because uh, kind of the power counting tells you that the three level mixes with one loop, two loop, and so on, everything is mixed. The question is if in this uh, argument, this counterintegral argument, you can kind of separate uh, the different contributions yeah. somehow that only the three level would contribute despite it's on the same footing as loops with fewer insertions or of uh, lower dimensional operators. And you can then make a statement directly about this higher dimensional term or not. That, uh, that's just not clear to me, yeah. Yeah, I, I can't say it's clear to me immediately either. And I'm probably not gonna reconstruct it in real time, but no, it's, an, it's a very fair question. I'm not sure, but I can, my memory is that there's definitely bounds on chiral perturbation theory, but how that subtle is resolved, I'm, I'm not sure it's a good question. Okay. Um, Yaroslav, it sounds like the, it, it might be the case in, in chiral perturbation theory that you have non-trivial analytic structure extending all the way to the origin in the complex S plane, right? Yeah, the thing is, for example, yeah, if I, let's say that I would like to bound somehow the OP6 operator, so next to next to leading order. And this three level insertion uh, in the, based on the power counting formula, the three level amplitude with this operator would be, would be the same as one loop amplitude with OP4 insertion, as mm -hmm. well as two loop amplitude with just OP2, yeah. just the nonlinear sigma model. Now, the, yeah, the Weinberg tells us that we should just take this together. We cannot really separate the two loop from one loop from three. Yeah, this is just a result at the given level of power counting. Now, if I take this formula and plug it here, would, I, would everything contribute or would it kind of split into three level, one loop, two loop? And I can make kind of statements separately about these things. In other words, if I only take the three level formula with the OP6, would that be consistent? And well, I take that formula, I plug it into your counterintegral, I get some bound. Does that bound make sense? I think generally, if the other operators give rise to an S squared part, you have to consider them all together, or you need to somehow construct a, a, a scattering experiment where you can separate them. But I think the argument in combination theory is you can't, so. Yeah. Yeah, the, the thing is, if they kinematically somehow separate here, uh, they must be considered together just for like generically, but somehow if the counter integral is kind of clever to separate them, but yeah, I don't even just don't know. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you just to, if this is at all helpful to think about this. Um, when we were doing our scattering, we needed to be careful to choose uh, certain colored states in the gluon case such that we weren't getting um, dimension six squared contributing to our amplitudes. Because if we did, then what would be the coefficient of this would be some dimension six squared and a dimension eight. And that net quantity has to be positive, but then that doesn't let me say any, make any clean statement really about either operator. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, sort of what's related to what Yaroslav is mentioning is that there's, there's just an example of renormalization Right, so the one loop term is, one loop effects are renormalizing those higher dimension operators. So have you thought about how renormalization group works in this context? So yeah, I, I have, we haven't thought about it in detail. I mean, one interesting question might be, although may, I just, I should think about this some more, is that the down um, better be satisfied under RG running. 
So if um, if it's positive one at the scale, of the and then I start RG running down, I better not then um, uh, head negative. They'll automatically be satisfied under RG. So, but I yeah, we have I can't say that I've I've sat down and I've done some calculations in each case in detail. No, that that that, that is a consideration by I think it by I read it by by, by Harry Sarah. And the claim is that if you if you satisfy at a one scale lambda, then you're running from the low scale, it's always got a positive effect from your lambdaization. Yeah. Yes, that's, a, that's, a, that's the general theorem. The RG running can only give a positive contribution. Right. Oh, oh, a way to see this in, the, since we have the slide up, a way to see this in the complex S plane is, so here the in, in this diagram, the, the um, the discontinuities are we're, we're imagining are from multi-particle production in the UV. But if you if you actually wanted to think about RG in the EFT, you would actually want to include discontinuities from loops of the IR fields, uh, the light degrees of freedom. In which case, you would have like little discontinuities going potentially all the way to the origin. Uh, and in that case, what what you would find is that. Of course, that discontinuity is, is also positive. It's also just secretly a cross section. And so the, the, the integral that you get by taking C, the, the C contour and blowing it up a little bit would, would give you the RG running of, uh, of this Wilson coefficient. Yeah, and, so, and so it would automatically have the right sign again by the optical theorem. Yeah. Oh, thanks. All right, let's thank Nick again. Yeah.